11, 12 years ago. Um, Some of y'all weren't here. Y'all don't remember it. But, yeah, I know, right? Yeah, I, I have, yeah, I have to see, I'll, I'll have to. Back in the day, uh, 11, 12 years ago, the district office was in Nacogdoches, yeah, right? right? At First Methodist Church, there was a little kind of a closet in there that the district office, the district superintendent had his office in there. Vita was the secretary. Uh, anyway, and they had a, a parsonage for the for the district superintendent. It was on Regay Street, kind of north end of Regay. And uh, Keith Whitaker, who's the district superintendent, and of course the, the the parsonage, you know, it was an overhouse, and it was in need of some repair work and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, long story short, they, they decided we need to move the district office to Lufkin and buy a parsonage near the golf course. I don't know why they wanted the golf course. It beats me. But anyway, <laughs> uh, there was a big hullabaloo <laughs> right about that. I remember us having at least couple of district-wide meetings, you know, where, where everybody got to get up and get to the microphone and, and speak their their piece about it. And, and uh, oh, well, I remember, I was in, living in Corrigan at the time, and my wife was the pastor in Corrigan, <laughs> and she was passionately for the project, <laughs> and got up and spoke, you know, I know one time, with tears streaming down her face, <laughs> for the project for moving it to Lefkin. God has a sense of humor, y'all. Ah, because a year later, here we come to Nacogdoches on staff at First Methodist Church Nacogdoches, which was for keeping the... the the district office in Nacogdoches, pretty much, I'd say most everybody was for it. Uh, God has a sense of humor. I, 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 he does. And, you know, um, we're talking about this, this passage has to do with not only salvation, which we should, which we should talk about, uh, in our daily, daily stuff, I mean, we don't think a whole lot about our salvation, do we? I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, I'm assuming everybody's saved here. Um, if you're not, I hope you're listening. <laughs> uh, God loved you and I enough to send His precious Son, the most precious life in existence, down here to pay the price for our sins, to go to the cross in our place. And, and and pay that price that, that, that we can't pay. Uh, wow. I mean, we don't consider that. And, and sometimes I think we take it for granted, maybe. And I certainly don't want to blow by that too quickly. But uh, God loves you enough that he paid the price for your sins, okay? And uh, I'll be happy to talk with anybody about that a little more. But I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that today. Um, Incidentally, that, that passage about the, the shepherd or the sheep and all that stuff, it kind of rings from Ezekiel in the Old Testament. Ezekiel 34, I'm just going to read you a little bit of this. Beginning with verse 11, For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search and find my sheep. I will be like a shepherd looking for his scattered flock. I will find my sheep and rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on that dark and cloudy day. I will bring them back home to their own land of Israel from among the peoples and nations. I will feed them. I will give them good pasture land. It goes on to say, I will tend my sheep. All that stuff. So look at Ezekiel 34. If you want to, you know, kind of get a little bigger, brighter picture about that, that shepherd metaphor that, that is being used here. Um, but I want to talk to you a little bit more about the life abundant. Um, how many of y'all have ever been like beat down? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I hope so. I hope y'all get kind of. times a week. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, really, really kind of, you know, life has really just stomped on you. I, I, I was wounded. 
when I walked in the, the doors of First United Methodist Church in Livingston in 95, 1995, summer of 1995, walked in the doors there, I was hurt. I was wounded. Um, because a lot life had beat me down by some stuff that happened. I'm not going to get all into that, but you know, y'all can imagine. I mean, things happen, right? Um, I didn't have a lot of joy. You know, I was, I was, I was at the bottom. You know, I was running on empty. Okay, um, I was just visiting that church. I, I wasn't a Methodist. Okay, I just moved to the town, and yeah, we were looking for a church, but we didn't. Know. We were, we were late. We weren't in the ministry or anything at that point in time. And uh, some things happened during that worship service. I mean, just some God things. Boom, boom, boom. And when I walked out the doors at the end of that worship service, I would, I'd been asked to go on a mission trip in 12 days to Costa Rica. Didn't know anybody, okay? Not a soul. Didn't know anybody's name. 12 days they were leaving to go to Costa Rica and they said, why don't you come and go with us? And I went on that trip. <laughs> I went on that trip because God had made a way for me to do it. I mean, we saved our tithe money. We were going to make a big splash at the new church, which is like, you know, it was a But, you know, we had, we had held it back for, I don't know, a few weeks. I don't know what it was, but but it just so happened it was just enough for me to pay for my trip to Costa Rica. You know, God had taken care of it. Because otherwise, I wouldn't have had the money to do that. It wouldn't have been an option. Uh, so anyway, I, I go on this trip not knowing a soul now. I mean, no, nobody. Uh, get down to, to Via Neely, Costa Rica. Now, it's, you know, it's an eight-hour bus ride from San Jose down through the mountains, way down on the south end near, near Panama. Uh, it's about... 20 minutes from the Panama border, um, start to work. We, we're mixing cement on the ground, y'all. If you haven't ever done that, I mean, what can I tell you? That's a back-breaking experience. You know, you're stooped over, just mixing it with sand and, and mortar mix or cement mix. And I was like, no, they didn't have a cement mixer. That was high tech, and they had none of that. So, uh, but I ended up with this young Costa Rican man, 18-year-old guy named Manuel. Uh, and, and we worked hard together all day. And when lunch came, it came time for lunch. We sat down together for lunch, you know, and, and, and I couldn't talk to him, you know, just two or three words, you know, in Spanish that I knew. He knew no English, but there was a connection made, people. I can't describe it other than to say there was some kind of, you know, beyond me type connection. Uh, and I think he felt it too because we were drawn to each other and we worked together all that week, okay? And, and I, oh, by the end of the week, I, I was, I mean, seriously, I was, I was crow hopping to get on the plane. I mean, I was dragging a leg back. But uh, we tried to get people to, to uh, translate so that we could communicate. And, and, and even our uh, people we took down there to do some Spanish couldn't, they couldn't understand it. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't know what the problem was. Didn't know there was a problem. Just, we just couldn't, couldn't quite get it to work. So I get on the bus on Friday, and of course I'm waving at Manuel. He's standing up there waving at us, you know, as we're about to pull off and we, we pull off and I hear Sue, the, the team leader from Livingston, Sue Mason, if you haven't looked it up. She mentioned to another lady and I just overheard and she said, you know that young man, Manuel, um, she said, you know the reason we couldn't, couldn't translate what he was saying, couldn't understand? And that person said, no. She said, he's deaf. Uh -huh. He can't hear. And of course, I, I've already got my heart, you know, with him, but then even more so when I realize as we're pulling away that he's dead. I couldn't forget Manuel, you know, 
after we came back. <clears throat> I actually got to see him again. How much time we got? I don't want to go too far with this. Um, the following year, we were in the same area. And, and this is a, I got a tell you, this is God thing. Um, we were staying in Golfino, you know, the same place we stayed before. We drove through his town of Via Neely to get to the banana plantation right on the Panama border where we worked. And, and we'd come back through every day. And I'd look out the window of the bus looking for Manuel, you know, and I never saw him. And finally, on, we worked all week. And finally, on Friday afternoon, uh, we, it's dark. And we, we're going to leave the tools at the parsonage in Via Neely. We had a big box full of tools we'd used all week. We're stinking to high heaven. I mean, we've been out there working, I mean, physical labor. Uh, we come in, and, and I visit with the pastor, you know, and I can't talk. He can't talk much English, and I can't talk much Spanish. But when we, when we kind of figure the tool thing out, I say to him, uh, Donde esta es Manuel Hijo? You know, as, which is, you know, where is Manuel, the, Manuel, the boy met Manuel? And he looks at me and is like, either he couldn't understand me or, or he didn't know how to, what to tell me. He didn't know how to, you know. And I, I, we were right there in the middle of that awkward moment. I, I mean, he, had, he we were just kind of looking at each other when I hear this at the back door. And he goes and answers the door, and it's this lady, like a middle-aged lady. And they start talking to each other, rapid-fire Spanish, you know, and they turn and look at me. And then they talk some more rapid-fire Spanish, and then they look back at me. And then a man appears at the back door, middle-aged guy, and they all start talking to each other in rapid-fire Spanish, and then they all three turn and look at me. And somebody happens to be there that, that understands what's going on, and, and they turn and they said, that's Manuel's mom and dad. And I'm standing there like, well, uh, and I kind of walk over that way, and I'm trying to, and then somebody walks in and said, Manuel just rode up outside on his bicycle. <laughs> Didn't know. I would have walked outside, and there he is. You know, he's been working all day. I've been working all day. Of course, you know, we hug each other. Don't care about the stink. And I give him a little old pocket cross or something like that. And, uh, you know, it was. It, we still not, can't communicate very well. Get back on the bus to leave. And everything was pitch black when we pulled up there. The church was black. The parsonage was dark. We didn't even think it was part, the pastor was home. But when we start to pull away, everything's lit up. The church doors are open. The lights are on. There's lights. I mean, the light in the darkness, you know, was just, I mean, that, that whole metaphor was, uh, was working that day. But that's not the end of the story. <laughs> this just kind of a bridge. Came back to the U.S., of course. Um, a couple of years later, I'm going back to Costa Rica, a different part of Costa Rica. Run into a guy that y'all know Gil Hankey? Yes. <laughs> I run into Gil Hankey. He was going to Costa Rica. Going to be there the same week I was. He had a team that was going to be in San Jose, the big city. And he always worked with special needs kids. Always went to a special needs uh, facility. And I, I don't know what all they did. He, he was a speech therapist, of course. And he tells me this out of the blue. I didn't. He just says, oh, and we're taking an audiologist with us this time. And of course, I'm like, what is that? <laughs> you know, and he said, we're collecting hearing aids and all to take with us. If you know some, and I'm like, hey, Gil, if I can get this kid from Via Neely to San Jose to the Methodist Center there, would y'all look at him and see? And he 
said, absolutely. And so I made some phone calls, you know. I, made some, I called Costa Rica, I called the, the medical center, talked to the, the missionary there, and I tell him the story. And he said, I'll, I'll call down there and talk with the pastor at the Neely. I didn't know how that was all going to pan out. That, that's a world away, right? I mean, I had no way. They don't have cell phones down there. I mean, uh, so I go, go to Costa Rica, end up in Punta Arenas, spend the week, come back, uh, come back to San Jose, to the Methodist Center. Gil and his team are there. They're busy. It's their last day, too, or last. Finally, after dinner, Gil calls me over to the side, and he said, uh, your friend was here. I said, really? Did he come? He said, yeah. And he said, we tried everything and nothing would work. So we tried all of our devices. He was stalling. <laughs> he said, but then we tried one of the great big old ones. And he said, it worked. said Manuel left here hearing for the first time. And I asked him, I said, how much do I owe you for that? He said, you don't owe me anything. So I go to the missionary at the Methodist Center and I was like, so how much do I owe for Manuel's he said, the church paid for his transportation over here. I said, well, don't I owe you something? He said, well, he was here two nights and ate with us. $20. <laughs> That's what that cost me. God is at work, people. He was trying to heal me, as, and he was trying to reach to this, this young, hard-working Christian young man in, in Costa Rica and trying to reach him and, and, and lift him up and help him. God cares about you and everything you're going through. He knows intimately about it, and He wants to reach into your world and heal you and bring you wholeness and, and bless us. Amen. Went to a funeral this week. Dick Boytail came to Nacogdoches. <clears throat> I don't like waiting, you know, waiting for somebody to bring up that old, <laughs> you know, stuff about the, the district parsonage and all that stuff being moved. Nobody ever said a word about it. Never said a word. And, and, and that church, and Carol and Dick Boytel loved on us, you know, to beat the band. Of course, you know, Judy's gone on. They were there with us through all that. And, you know, when I was standing there waiting on Carol uh, Thursday morning, uh, she hadn't gotten to the church yet. And she comes in the side door of the sanctuary. And, and you know, I, I got the distinction of being the first one to get to her. And I just hugged on her. And, uh, you know, Dick and Judy are, they're, they're there before the throne. Uh, and that's where we plan to be, right? By God's grace, we will be there. But in the meanwhile, we get to love on each other, right? And we get to support each other and be a blessing to each other. And it's all good. I mean, God is Good. I don't know what political party Dick and Carol were. And you know what? I don't care. 
It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's not going to matter in eternity. God doesn't care. He's, he's working in spite of all that mess, you know, that's going on. Working across national lines, you know, to heal all of us and to lift us all up. Amen. 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 We're going to stand and sing our closing hymn here when we all get to heaven. How about that? <laughs>